In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. A few uh, days ago, my, my family and I, were, we were watching um, Bob Ross paint. And, um, you know, as a kid, I couldn't stay awake watching Bob Ross paint. Um, this time, we, we, Mindy and I were watching with our two little girls, and, and uh, Daphne, who is six, has just begun to do a lot of art. Uh, Artwork. So like every morning she wakes up, boom, 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 boom. You hear her feet run to the little art table, rips out a piece of paper and just starts going to town, right? So we're watching sort of with an agenda this time. We, actually, we were just flipping channels and we got stuck. Daphne says, oh, let's, let's watch that. So we're watching Bob Ross in his 70s jeans, which I wish I had a pair of right now. But, um, and um, Mindy, my wife, is explaining a little bit of what Bob is doing to Daphne, who's sort of taking notes in her head. Okay, Ma, so I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. And at one point, Mindy says something that has stuck with me and I think will aid us in our study of Scripture today. Mindy says to Daphne, you see, Daphne, while Bob makes these random marks on the page, and it's really confusing and we don't know what he's doing, if you watch all the way to the end, it will make sense. It will make sense. These random scratches, right, of dark color or some bizarre pink or whatever that Bob puts on the page that, like, where did that come from? He'll even narrate it, right? Like, whoa, that's kind of crazy. Let's see where that goes, right? This is Bob. And, but if you watch to the end, it makes sense. Today, in our Old Testament lesson, we are invited to step back and with the eyes of a child, watch as God, what one pastor calls God's great parade of providence works out a masterpiece in the lives of Naaman, a slave girl, even the nations of Israel and Aram. Would you turn with me to page 262 if you'd like to follow along as we study in our Old Testament lesson? Today's theme is the providence of God. Page 262, 2 Kings chapter 5. The providence of God. Do you know this term, providence? What is providence? What does providence mean? What does it have to do with your life? Um, the cat Catechism of the Catholic Church describes God's providence as his guidance of creation toward perfection. His guidance of creation toward perfection. Now, we are Anglican, so I've quoted the Catholic definition, and I will give you the Presbyterian or Reformed definition. Are you ready? The Protestants, and I can't really think of a better expression of God's providence than this, put it this way in the 1500s document called the Heidelberg Catechism. It, it, is, a, it is a masterful uh, piece of theological literature, the Heidelberg Catechism. In the 1500s, as Reformed folk, um, we might have been asked, tell me, what is the providence of God? And we would have all memorized, being the good Reformed Christians that we were in Germany, we would have answered just like this. Listen to this definition. The almighty and ever-present power of God, that's the providence, by which God upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Now, that's the providence of God, right? Guiding all creation to perfection. That's what we mean by providence. Three observations about God's divine providence, this master uh, of art, creating a masterpiece with human history, this great parade that we're watching. Three 
uh, observations about this providence. First, it's power. The power of God's providence should lead us to praise. Look at verse 1 in chapter 5. Where do we see the power of God's providence? Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master because by him, by Naaman, the Lord had given victory to Aram. Okay, now, let, let me just make sure you, you understand. Naaman is not a friend of God at this point. What the, what the text just tells us is Naaman and the, the Arameans, the, that, the army that he's in charge of, they have defeated God's people. They are the enemies. It's like in a TV series when you're watching, there's an episode about the hero or the heroine. And then the directors move you over to the enemy camp and there's a whole episode about the enemy and what's going on in their lives. That's what, what's happening in 2 Kings 5. We have moved into enemy territory. And we've zoomed in on the commander of the army that's defeated God's people. By the way, the writer, this is for, written for Israel. The writer tells us God did that. You don't know about the power of the providence of God? It's no respecter of persons. There is no, uh, there's no army, there's no group of people who, they may be unaware of God, but God's not unaware of them. God is not just in charge of Christians, FYI, right? God's in charge of everybody, everybody. And even when it looks like for Christians that we have, quote, lost or something, God's in charge of that too. Naaman just beat up God's people and God allowed that to happen. It was by God's hand. That's all in verse 1. The power of providence. Keep going. 1B. The man, Naaman, though a mighty warrior, suffered from a skin disease. Some translation would say leprosy. We don't really know what the skin disease was. But here's the point. He's a mighty warrior who's had apparently military success. And yet, and yet... God's in charge of his fate, of his body. Do you know what it's like to have lots of success and then to have something sideswipe you, right? As if all of a sudden you realize, oh, wait a minute, I guess I'm not in control. Control, one of my psychology supervisors used to say, is an illusion. It's an illusion. We're not in control. And I bet somewhere in Naaman, the back of Naaman's mind, every time he looked at his skin, he remembered that. I feel so mighty when I'm on the battlefield. And somewhere, somehow I can just tell I, I'm not in charge. God had given this man a skin disease. Verse 2, now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. Okay, now the plot just thickens. This is, by the way, one of the most fun stories in all of the Old Testament. The, the irony, the twists, the turns, it's a beautiful piece of literature and it's God's word. Verse two, we find out that God in his powerful providence has allowed a young girl from Israel, one of his, his, his own children, God's children, to be led into captivity. God's in charge of that. Not only is God in charge of the tragedy that befell this young girl who becomes a slave, God's in charge of who enslaves her. So where does she end up being a slave? In the commander's family with access to the commander of Israel's enemy. Fascinating. It's quite reasonable, by the way, to suspect that years after this event took place, when the people of Israel were themselves in captivity to Babylon, they were sitting around without culture now and without uh, an identity, without a place to live. They were all in exile and they would be telling stories about God's faithfulness. And someone would have said, hey, remember that story? Not about Naaman, but about the little slave girl who was one of us who got who got taken captive and got put, God put her into Naaman's family. And then, and the story continues. 
It's important, verse 2, that we know God's in charge even of this little girl's fate. She's enslaved by Naaman, people of Aram, and she has access to Naaman. Verse 3, so the little girl said to her mistress, Naaman's uh, wife, apparently, if only my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. Now, in God's providence, of all the people that could have been led into Naaman's family, God puts a little girl who happens to know about Elisha. The reason this is pertinent information is because in a few verses, we're going to find out that the king of Israel, for some reason, doesn't bring to mind Elisha. So it's like the king of Israel doesn't know doesn't know to mention the prophet as a possible healing for Naaman's disease, but this little slave girl does. That's God's powerful providence. Verse 4, so Naaman went in and told his lord, king of Aram, just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, go then, and I'll send along a letter to the king of Israel. God's Power, his intervening in the world doesn't just touch individuals, it works at the level of nations. Do you think that God is surprised by what's happening in Russia and Ukraine? God works at the level of nations. Do you know the power of God's providence in your story? How, when you look back and remember, the events, the circumstances, even the internal changes in your life, how have you seen the power of God's providence? If you're not a follower of Jesus, this story should be of interest to you today because uh, like Naaman, maybe God has his eyes set on you. Notice, Naaman did not know or for all we know care about Israel's God. Who is Israel's God? What? Oh, let me, please, you know, I want to worship. No, no, no. Naaman wants his skin disease gone, right? Naaman is not aware of Israel's God. Israel's God is aware of Naaman. If you're not a follower of Jesus, what a great reminder today. Like, God sees you. He knows you. You don't know all the answers? That's okay. We're glad you're here. Receive what God has for you. Um, application number two, all of this talk about God's power and his providence might make us feel a little bit uncomfortable because in our world, people are running rampant with power and it doesn't feel good. Lots of uh, those who are weak are being preyed upon in all kinds of ways. But what does God do with his power? Here's the quick answer. If we rush to the New Testament, we finish the big story of God's um, um, scriptures we find out that God takes his power and in the person of Jesus Christ, he gives up his power and he comes among us to serve us. Laying down his life all the way to the point of laying down his life, giving it up in death on a cross. That's what Paul tells us in Philippians 2. So let the power of God's providence in this story impact you. Let it lead you to just stand back and watch God, like Bob Ross, make these masterful brush strokes, blend these beautiful colors, right? Here's the second observation about God's providence from this story. The pattern, God's providence, I, I, I don't know why, in God's infinite wisdom, has, it's almost like a pattern. It's a, um, it's, it, it's a pattern of disruption, actually. It's a pattern that's uneasy, that's troubling, that's mysterious, that doesn't make sense to us. Look at verse 5b, the end of verse 5 and following. So Nathan went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold. You get the point, all of his riches, right? Verse 6, he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, king, know that I have sent to you my servant servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his skin disease. One king writing to another. Notice Naaman's assumptions about how this healing is going to take place. Naaman assumes and expects, I will bring my power, my might, my riches, and then I'll bring X, and then Y will happen, right? And, but God disrupts that. Keep reading. This is God's providence in all of its disruptive pattern. 
when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his skin disease? Just look and see how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. Now, I don't know if the author intended this to be humorous or not. And as I read the story, it seems humorous to me. If you're Naaman and you want your skin disease healed and you go to the king of Israel, it's like, and the king makes it all about him and his, and like, like, what are you trying to do to me? That's what he's saying, right? Like, I can imagine if I'm Naaman, I'm like, king of Israel, don't make this all about you. Why does this have to be all about you, right? What about my skin disease? But you get the point. There's, There's a disruption in the communication. Imagine uh, all the higher-ups all around the globe today who will be on secret phones to one another, making plans and scheming and creating riches for the nations and all the rest of it. And imagine God, whenever He wants, for whatever reason He wants, in all of His goodness, loving kindness, and power disrupting those conversations at will. That's what's happening in verse 7. Um, by the way, you would think the king of Israel would know God's prophet or would understand the, what was happening, but he, he doesn't. Why, why he doesn't, we're not sure. Verse 8. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. Now remember, prophets represent God to the world. They represent God's truth, God's revelation to the world. They speak on God's behalf. So verse 9, so Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Hang with me, verse 11. But Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me, this prophet would surely come out of his house and stand and call on the name of the Lord. You know, make a big deal, right? Because I'm the commander of the army. But he doesn't. In verses uh, 8 through 11, God is disrupting Naaman's pride. It's interesting that this man who doesn't know or, for all we know, care about the God of Israel, the God of Israel has reached inside of his heart and is now starting to tune his heart, to woo him, to change him, to meddle with him, right? And the way it comes to to Naaman is not as a street preacher saying, turn, you know, turn or burn. Like, it's it's, it's, it's subtle. It's at the level of Naaman's pride. But I thought, I thought you were going to make a big deal about this. Because, I mean, I'm a big deal, right? So God disrupts Naaman's pride. Look at verse 12, because the pride goes deeper than just the individual level. Are not Abana and uh, Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? In a little way, we're saying this is nationalistic pride, Right? You want me to wash in Israel's dirty river? That's disgusting. Are not the two other rivers near my home, are they not better, right? We are, the the Arameans are way better than Israel. You've got God disrupting his personal pride, his nationalistic pride. Do you know this disruption in your own life? Where did you think that Elisha the prophet was going to pop out and make a big deal about you and for you, right? Or where did you merely just, it wasn't about power, you just had hopes and dreams. And it seems as though God dashed them. You wanted to go to college in Texas and somehow you end up in New York City. You wanted to marry this person and somehow you end up marrying that person. You live with an ongoing medical condition that you never could have anticipated, perhaps like Naaman. You live with mental illness and you have no idea why God would throw you that curveball. What disruption from God's providence do you know? William Cooper, uh, I've mentioned him before, author of um, many hymns that we sing. One of my favorite hymns that he wrote is called God Moves in Mysterious in a mysterious way. 
He was an 18th century Englishman. He, was, um, he, um, he suffered a great deal. God, in God's providence, threw William Cooper a lot of curveballs. He lost his mom at age six. He was shipped by his dad to a boarding school where he suffered physical and something, other kinds of abuse. Later in life, um, Cooper was forbidden to marry the woman that he wanted to marry, and he ends up suffering for a long time with depression, and he spent a great many days in different asylums. And in that backdrop, in that kind of disruption, Cooper writes these words about God's providence. God moves in mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. That's how powerful he is. Deep in unfathomable minds with never failing skill, God treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Are you picturing Bob Ross at the, at the easel, right? Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Daphne, wait till the end. Wait till the end. Maybe it will make sense in the end. Behind a frowning providence, God hides a smiling face. That's his countenance toward you and me of love. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. See today not just the power of God's providence, but the pattern, it's disruptive. So that when your life is disrupted, you can accept it and receive it, not as a surprise or something foreign or alien to your experience, but to know that this has been the experience of God's people all the way back to the beginning. Don't spend too much time. I know it's a little bit human to spend some time. Don't spend too much time asking why. Deep in his unfathomable minds with never failing skill, God knows what he's doing even if we don't. Where has he disrupted your life? May it lead you to patience. The power of providence leads us to praise. And the pattern of providence leads us, Lord willing, to patience, prayerful patience. Where is this in the life of Jesus, by the way? Well, I hope you're thinking of the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus says literally, not my will, but yours, Father. Not my, uh, uh, so, um, um, not my feeble attempt at providence, but God, yours be done. Disrupt my life. I don't want it. I'd like to choose something different. Disrupt it, God. Here's the third and final observation about providence from this story. Verses 13 and 14, the last two verses, it's the people of providence. God's people of providence should lead us to live lives of purpose. Verse 13. So Naaman's just been quite angry. He's been disrupted, right? His way of doing things, he's not expected this to happen. Uh, this, the, the prophet didn't even come out of his house for Pete's sake. And now we have the servants once again speaking. But Naaman's servants, uh, uh, Naaman's servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? Now, this is common sense. How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So Naaman went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan. According to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. It's the end of the passage as it's given to us in the lectionary, let me read to you the one following verse, 15. Because this is truly the end of the story, at least as we're reading it. Then Naaman returned to Elisha, he and all his company, he came and stood before him and said, now, this is a pagan speaking, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. That's amazing. Someone who had no knowledge of God, doesn't care if God exists or not, winds up encountering God and makes a statement. He recognizes the truth that this is God's world and he's unrivaled in his power. Who are the people 
that God used in this story to make this happen. Perhaps this is the main point. We mentioned maybe years down the road, Israel sitting in their own captivity telling the story, and I wonder if they would remember it, not as the story of Naaman's healing, but as the story of the little Israelite slave girl who was used by God to bring blessing to a nation that didn't even care about God. Christian, this is why we're here. We exist, like Jesus, for the life of the world. When we talk about being God's chosen people, his special people, what we're saying is uh, it's, not a, it's not a thing of pride by any means. As one, as one um, um, commentator put it, uh, this is a great quote. As one commentator put it, Israel is elected by God Uh, uh, not to the exclusion of the rest of creation, but in order to provide a concrete witness to God that God exists, that God is here, that God loves you for creation's benefit and on behalf of creation. That's why we're here. Who are the people of providence in this story that bring blessing to the world? It's the servants. It's the so-called powerless. To be a woman in this culture, I imagine you can, uh, you, I, I, I think you can imagine what that would mean. To be a woman and a slave, as one commentator put it, this was the equivalent of being a non-person, as having no identity, no value, no worth in this day and age. And from this powerless little girl, God changes the life of a person who in our eyes would have been the highest of the high, right? A military commander who's just defeated another nation. And then in 13, when God uses the other servants, just to say something common sense to Naaman, I wonder if you know this kind of purpose in your life. Like, do you realize that no matter how powerless you feel, no matter how upside down your circumstances feel, because some of you are this little girl today, in some way, shape, or form, you relate not to name and not to the powerful person, but to the little girl who's lost any value, worth, or identity, and so she's helpless, right? Some of you are like, oh, that's me. Well, good news, friends, good news. You are like the prime time kind of person that God wants to use to change the world. Did you get that? To change the world. You're the little little mistake that Bob Ross, the mistake that Bob Ross makes on his page that then by the end of the painting becomes the most beautiful part of the piece of art. That's you. Do you know this kind of purpose, friend? knowing about the providence of God, its power, the pattern of disruption, and that you are the person of providence will lead you to that place, place of purpose. God help us know this, no matter our situations, whether we're aware of you or not, whether we love you or not, whether we trust you or not, God, would you make yourself known to us in these ways and change our lives like you changed the life of Naaman, And all of those in this story, we ask it in Jesus' victorious name. Amen.